My name is Lawrence Holmes. Uh, I was born in 1935 and I run the Varian Bunkers uh, Museum. Uh, I am also a member of the Royal Observer Corps Association. Why was the Royal Observer Corps three-man bunker system effectively reorganised in 1968 and what effect did it have on the Royal Observer Corps itself? Well, I'm convinced that the 68 reorganisation was simply an economy measure. Um, I think the scientists had realised that they could get just as good a cover with less posts. Uh, and they probably looked at it, calculated uh, what the minimum amount of posts was. Uh, that was about 875, 900 posts. And so they simply closed down 600, 700 of them uh, in that reorganisation. Um, I can remember, because I was involved in that, I'd been in the Corps then for nearly 15, well, 12 years, and uh, uh, we were terrified, and I will use that word, we were terrified that our post was going to be the one, or one of the ones, that was to be closed. And uh, it was a closely guarded secret uh, which posts were to be closed and which posts were going on. Uh, we had a big meeting at the time I was serving in 8 group. We had a big meeting at Coventry, uh, Lawford Heath, and um, I can remember going into the uh, meeting room. It was full of all the chief observers of the posts concerned. Uh, there would have been some 40 or 50 people there, and the group commandant simply stood up and he said the following posts will stand down, and he went through them. And you could look around the room to see people who were uh, turned ashen, uh, people who were shocked, uh, people who were relieved, people who were happy. And uh, I happened to be very friendly with a, an adjoining post chief observer, and he was the one that was cut in our cluster. I fortunately went on, and I've got to say, very selfishly, I was relieved. I wanted my ROC life to go on, very, very much so. Uh, so I was relieved that I was going on. Um, I was very sorry for him that his posts had been stood down. When we got outside of the meeting, uh, this man was uh, very, very annoyed. Uh, why have they closed me down? We were one of the better posts, etc., etc. And he said, well, I don't care what they want. I am going to continue to meet. And for a year, he actually met unpaid every week as a, an operational post until they had a word with him and said, look, you have got to close down and that is it. But it, it did cause some resentment. Uh, it, it, it caused some elation. Um, and uh, fortunately, quite a few of the personnel that were made redundant transferred to adjoining posts because there was always a, a post shortage problem. Uh, and so they simply, most of them, transferred to adjoining posts. Some were so annoyed they just left the call and that was it. Uh, but that was the effect. It was a very real and very hurtful reorganisation. Was the Royal Observer Corps seen as part of the establishment? And if so, was it ever affected by social and cultural changes from its inception right the way through to, to when the Corps stood down? I don't think it was uh, regarded as part of any establishment. Um, I think we were exceedingly proud of our RAF connections. In World War II, we had the status of a group in fighter command. We wore the RAF blue uniform. Uh, we had many connections with the RAF. We had flights with the RAF. And we were simply a bunch of people who were in a quasi-RAF organisation. Um, we were not particularly aware of any establishment or political shenanigans or anything like that. Um, and um, as far as I was concerned, that continued from the moment I joined to the moment I left. What happened to bunkers during the time of um, Nixon's detente? So during the 1970s, obviously, there is an easing of tension between East and West, arguably. 
What happened to um, to the Royal Observer Corps during that time? Did you find that you were doing less exercises and less work in the bunkers? Mm. No, from from 1968 onwards, we were very much um, go ahead. We didn't vary. <coughs> um, we trained the same. We trained the same number of hours right the way through to 1991. We still had six or seven exercises per year. They were still as intense and as serious as ever. And we were simply not aware of any ups and downs in the political climates or the likelihood of nuclear uh, war varying. We simply trained for that eventuality. And our, tra our training certainly didn't vary and we didn't sort of ease up or anything like that. Uh, we still trained every week and we still had our exercises. What was your role outside of um, what was your role with the bunker in Truro? Um, well when I moved from Nottinghamshire to Cornwall uh, I joined the ops room crew <coughs> in, uh, in Truro. I became a tape centre supervisor and uh, having been a post observer in 8 group um, in Farnsfield, um, I, I, I became uh, an ops room tape centre supervisor. I had to learn all the, the, the other side, the plotting side. And uh, ultimately I applied for and got uh, an officer job and became the duty contractor. One of three, one of three in Truro, and this was quite normal. <coughs> And uh, so I actually ran the full ops room for, the duty, for, for, for the, my tour of duty. Um, and then of course in 1973, uh, Cornwall suffered, uh, which was 11 Group, suffered a reorganisation and uh, the ops room was closed down. Uh, all the posts were transferred to Exeter and I had to transfer out to a post, which I did, at Madron. And then I went to Mitchell Post and then in 1975, they activated a special unit in the Truro Ops Room called the NRC, Nuclear Reporting Cell. I applied for and got the officer's job there and I stayed there until 1995. Um, and the NRC was like a mini Ops Room. Uh, we gave a specialised plotting service uh, using all the information generated by the Royal Observer Corps at large. Uh, and. Uh, uh, it, it was a very, very interesting uh, part of my career. Uh, when all the um, Observer Corps closed down in 91, uh, the NRCs actually went on for a short time, till 1995, uh, still giving a specialised nuclear reporting service. In fact, we actually, for a time, uh, developed into NBC training, uh, and we started to look at chemical warfare and chemical plotting, um, but uh, sadly uh, they deemed that that was no requirement for that anymore and in, on the 31st of December 1995 we too were stood down. So how unique and how important is Varian Post? Well, I think it's very unique. Um, they were on stand down, there were some 875 posts <coughs> actually closed. Um, there were 1,600 built and 700 odd stood down in 1968. They were either demolished or they'd fallen into disrepair um, in 91. All of the 875 operational posts were stood down. Some were sold, some were demolished. Um, to date, my records show that only about 70 of those 900 posts have been preserved in some way or another. Out of the 70 that have been preserved, only about 12 have been preserved and are fully equipped, like this one, like Varian Bunker. Um, out of the 12 that have been preserved and are fully equipped, only about six are preserved, fully equipped and open to the public on a systematic basis. One of the reasons why Varian Post has survived is that the original land was owned by the National Trust 
uh, and although a group of us in Truro took a lease out on it from 96 uh, to 2006, from 2006 Varian Bunker has operated under the umbrella of the National Trust who were very, very keen and very helpful to perpetrate uh, this as a, a nuclear museum and uh, it has been open to the public uh, about uh, six times a year but it is unique because there aren't many in the UK. Uh, two years ago the National Trust got some money and renovated the nearby decoy command bunker of World War II vintage and now on open days we open up the decoy command bunker and the nuclear bunker. My records show that although uh, there are quite a few decoy command bunkers scattered around the UK, particularly in East Anglia, there are, I have no record of any other being preserved. So to find a preserved World War II decoy command bunker and a preserved equipped uh, bunker 30 metres apart is truly unique. Why do you believe it's so important to maintain the heritage of Varian and also the Royal Observer Corps' heritage itself? Well, I believe in heritage of anything. I, I, I think that uh, in many, many spheres, uh, heritage is important. We should look back. We should be proud of what happened and what we were. And that's no different for uh, a Battle of Britain pilot uh, and, and, and I think the Observer Corps is, is the same. It was a unique organisation. We have a long and proud history from 1925 to 1995. <coughs> we were part-time for most of that time. We had two interesting roles, aircraft reporting and nuclear reporting. And uh, I, 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 I think that um, uh, the memory of all those people and the work we did is important. Um, it, it's quite important to realise that in a, had a nuclear war happened, all the reporting of the information would have been in the hands of spare time volunteers. I know I've said that before, but uh, it's an important aspect and that should be stressed and that should be preserved. And I hope that what I'm doing and quite a number of others are doing throughout the country uh, uh, actually helps in educating the public uh, in what the Observer Corps did and what we were like and what it was like. Uh, lots of people w wonder what it was like in the Battle of Britain or uh, in D-Day. Uh, and it's surprising to me how many people say to me, what was it like in the Cold War? Well, I never actually thought much about it at the time. Um, I wasn't particularly frightened, uh, but I do think that it was a period uh, quite a dangerous period in the country's history and I think the Observer Corps' work was important and should be recognised. When you look back at your time, when you look back at the whole of your life, mm -hmm. what memories stand out the most for you? In the Observer Corps you mean? Um, I think um, the Esprit de Corps is probably the one thing which has been consistent all the way through the existence of the Corps. <clears throat> um, it was, I would say, the highest of any organisation I've ever known. Uh, friendships were made many, many years ago, which still exist today, and the enthusiasm of, of so many people uh, has made the Corps into a unique organisation. <clears throat> Within that generalised statement, there are many um, events uh, commemorative events <clears throat> and whether they be something at the Albert Hall or parading at the Cenotaph or going to a, a really impressive dinner uh, where somebody had retired or, or, or it was to celebrate something um, you know there are so many I, 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 I sort of would hesitate to pick one out um, Funnily enough, the, some of the most memorable occasions are when, uh, s when something's closed down. Uh, when the Corps closed down in 91, we had very, very large and moving uh, stand-down dinners, which, which were quite memorable. Um, and, and, and also, uh, 
more than one organisation, uh, more than one uh, event uh, that I, att I was invited to attend at service establishments, whether that be St Morgan or Cold Rose, um, and they were two were very, very memorable. Uh, so yeah, it's a whole mixture.